afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fall edition of the Garfield Institute of the Garfield Institute Seminars. Uh, we have as our guests this afternoon two very interesting gentlemen, Thomas Mann and William Galston. And uh, without much further ado, I'm going to ask Monica if she will introduce our guests. I just want to say briefly what our uh, agenda is this afternoon. It is, as uh, we typical, typically plan these things, uh, we'll go until about 6.15 or 6.30. Uh, each of our gentlemen is going to make a kind of an introductory statement. And then uh, I will recognize at least four questions that have been prepared by four groups of our Garfield scholars. And following those questions and the answers to them, um, we will throw the Q&A uh, session uh, over to the audience. Um, so you can listen up and prepare your questions for them then. Those of you who are staying for dinner, um, we will also have a chance to uh, have at these gentlemen uh, in the dessert and coffee period following the dinner right next door in Dick's. So, Monica, please. Hello, everybody. Um, tonight we have uh, Mr. Thomas Mann and Ms. Uh, Dr. William Galston, um, two highly distinguished scholars who are going to talk with us tonight and share their thoughts about the topics of partisanship and the future of American democracy. Uh, Dr. Galston is the professor uh, at University of Meriden College Park and was the founding director of the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. Dr. Galston has contributed to numerous news outlets, including a recent article posted to the Huffington Post's website about last week's presidential debate, which I'm sure many of us watched. Um, Dr. Galston serves as the Ezra Zilka Chair in the Brookings Institute's Government Studies Program, where he works with our other distinguished panelist, Thomas Mann. Dr. Mann is the Harriman Chair and Senior Fellow at the Governance Studies at the Brookings Institute and specializes in American politics and public policy. He's taught at numerous universities, including Georgetown and Princeton, Dr. Mann has written many books, including two with Norman Ornstein, the most recent of which is entitled It's Even Worse Than It Looks, It's Outside, You Guys Can Pick It Up, and the Garfield Scholars read it, and we have diligently prepared questions about the book um, for after the discussion. Uh, the Garfield Institute, including the scholars and our professors, are especially excited to host this panel because um, we're most sensitive to the, to the talk of partisanship and democracy when federal election season approaches, as it is now. And we hope that what we hear tonight from Drs. Mann and Galston will allow us to understand the news and American politics, American politics generally a bit more intelligently. So please join me in welcoming Thomas Mann and William Galston. Thank you very much. What a beautiful day. It's just gorgeous here at Hiram College. Now I understand why you're here and I appreciate you coming in from out of that magnificent weather. I mean, we, Bill and I left Washington this morning. It was 82 and foggy, just like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> now, who would have guessed after that bizarre performance at the Republican convention that, that Clint Eastwood was really on to something? I don't know how many of you have seen the new New Yorker cover, but it's, it's a wonderful picture of uh, poor Jim Lair somewhere pushed in the background. Uh, Mitt Romney standing at one podium, looking over and speaking at the other podium that has no one there at all. Um, uh, the president's taken uh, a, uh, a hard hit, uh, and it has scrambled the election. Um, and you are sitting in ground zero of uh, this, this amazing election. It, lead story in today's New York Times, right, page one above the fold, first story on the right, all about Ohio and its significance uh, uh, for the race. Uh, those of us who live in states like Maryland uh, have swing state uh, envy. Uh, we, don't, we don't have this experience, but I have to tell you, um, 
And tell me if the mic is, uh, is too loud, maybe I'll stand back. How's that sounding? Is that okay? Good. Uh, we actually live in the Washington DC area and because the DC markets are really important in Northern Virginia, which, which has a large fraction of the voters in the state of Virginia, which is the other most uh, visible and significant swing states, we managed to get our share of, uh, of political ads as, uh, as well. In any case, it feels better just being here in the middle of it and, and especially being at Hiram College. So I'd like to, to thank John and Kathy uh, uh, for their invitation and, and their hospitality. And I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to uh, uh, to share the panel, in addition to uh, with John, with Bill Galston, who's who's been a friend of decades, and and my colleague at Brookings for the last uh, last seven months. Uh, the temptation uh, is so much to to speak about the election because it's visible, it's a month away, it's important, and I don't have any doubt in the course of our conversation we will be talking about it. Uh, but our topic today, as Monica said, is uh, partisanship and the future of American democracy. Uh, that's a value-free title. It. Uh, uh, it uh, doesn't necessarily say partisanship is bad and our American democracy is in trouble, but I bet that's the first thing you thought about when you saw, when you saw the title. All is not well in the body politic in, in America. Uh, we and our politicians love to talk about American ex exceptionalism. We are la clam de la clam. Everything about our country is, uh, is the best, is special, and yet the, the reality is right now we have, we have some serious problems uh, uh, with, our, with our democracy, with our capacity uh, to govern ourselves in the face of some really extraordinary uh, times that, uh, that we've we've been through. We're not the only country, and again, in the course of our conversation, we might have an opportunity to see if anyone's doing it better around the world uh, and what lessons we might, uh, we might be able to draw from them. Uh, I think it's important, for example, to say at the beginning that however difficult this uh, uh, this economic recovery has been, and it's been slow and disappointing and painful. We, we're doing better than most other countries, uh, certainly the European uh, countries, uh, who have followed other tax and, uh, and actually had, uh, had significantly poor, poor performance. Nonetheless, we know we face big problems. In the short term of restoring a level of economic growth that can produce the demand for consumer goods that uh, give business the confidence to, uh, to take on new workers and create a virtuous cycle, while at the same time dealing with a whole host of, uh, of challenges uh, from the obvious ones of, uh, uh, of fiscal policy and, and debt to uh, absolutely essential efforts to slow the growth of healthcare costs in the public and private uh, sectors to, uh, to bring our, our workforce uh, uh, up to the level uh, in terms of education training they need to, uh, uh, to take on the jobs of the 21st century. Uh, the problems go beyond that, but the, the point is we have, we have some immediate short-term problems and we have 
We have challenging problems that need to be solved in uh, grapple with uh, now, but which would importantly affect us in the intermediate and long term. Those are the challenges, but we know what to do for the most part. I mean, it's not rocket science if all you are doing is looking at this as a pragmatist, as a problem solver. We've had enough groups out there talking about it who aren't caught up in, in sort of partisan wars, and we pretty much know what has to be done, but we have zero confidence in our ability to do it. We really do, and that's the, I think that's the source of our, of our concerns right now. The levels of public trust uh, in government uh, are uh, sadly low, and even that indicator is dramatically affected by whether you're a Republican or a Democrat just as every other perception is right now. Because a Democrat is in the White House, Republicans have less trust of government than they had when a Republican was in the office, and vice versa, uh, 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 to be sure. The ratings of Congress uh, reached record lows, got to 9% approval, as, as Senator John McCain said, it's down to staff and blood relatives, and he's not sure about the latter, uh, given the predilections of his daughter. Uh, uh, it, the 112th Congress is making history, this Congress, as the least productive uh, since uh, records were kept uh, about the productivity of, of Congress. It, uh, it's really quite amazing. If anything, the concerns about this Congress are, are what they did do that did more harm than good. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's sad for me to say that because with my colleague Norm Ornstein, um, uh, I have been in Washington over four decades and much of that time has been taken trying to help people understand what the first branch of government is supposed to be and what it does and its essential role in, in our constitutional system, defending it against what I think are cheap shots and, and uh, 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 inaccurate uh, descriptions and criticisms of the institution. Uh, but alas, uh, over the past decade, we've gotten increasingly concerned about, about how it's functioning. Uh, six years ago, we wrote a book called The Broken Branch. Uh, now we've, we've uh, published a book called It's Even Worse Than It Looks. If this trend line uh, continues, uh, the sequel we have in mind is Run For Your Lives. <laughs> uh, that's, Listen, the, the fact is it's not working right, and the signs of it are all around. We've, we've, we have a permanent war going on between the parties, and it's not something that's just cut off from real Americans out there in the country who are all, of course, moderate, centrist, uh, problem-solving, and... Uh, and deeply uh, 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 concerned about seeking information and thoughtful about the, what needs to be done to solve the problems. The, the reality is uh, our politics is characterized by a, a deep and abiding partisan polarization that has been developing over a period of, uh, of decades. Uh, uh, and that polarization is coming into conflict with our constitutional system. Guess what? The framers did mention parties in the Constitution, although political parties started uh, during George Washington's presidency. But remember, the whole design of the system was to check and balance and separate powers and, and to create the incentives uh, 
for elected officials representing diverse communities to figure out a way to come together and resolve problems and differences peacefully without having to resort to violence. Uh, that's what the purpose was to, to create a basis for strong executive power, for strong legislative power, and to have a judicial branch that, that could play a, a critical role as, uh, as well. But what we find is with our party system today, uh, so deeply polarized uh, with, with a minority party that is like a parliamentary party, vehemently adversarial and oppositional, uh, no interest in participating with the other side and in, in, uh, uh, in problem solving. It's, it's partly because of the differences, ideological differences that, that are part of all of this that we've had over a long period of time. I'm sure Bill will talk more systematically about this, the, a change from a party system that slopped over uh, one another, that, that included mostly uh, uh, members of various ideological dispositions. There was lots of overlap. Uh, and, and now those parties have pulled apart. Uh, uh, Republicans more conservative, uh, right of center Democrats more, more liberal. Uh, that has been evolving over time. It's uh, many forces are at work, uh, and we all see it now. Part of it is just the, the, uh, the big sort. The sh people pick their communities based on uh, their own sets of values and beliefs and looking for like-minded people and we create enclaves of uh, conservative and liberal or moderate um, uh, uh, sentiments and lo and behold we elect representatives uh, who espouse those values who don't really talk to people with other views working against the whole constitutional design. You could imagine if we had a parliamentary system um, a minority could engage in all of the obstruction and opposition they wanted. They could raise holy hell uh, about the majority, but they couldn't keep it from putting its program in place and then having a period of time, three, four, five years, uh, to implement it and then have the public hold them accountable. But that's not how our system works. We have separate elections for the President and the Congress. Right? And we have a midterm election only for uh, the House and the Senate, a third of uh, the Senate, two years after uh, the presidential election. So the possibilities of divided party uh, government, of, uh, of a, a popular president elected with substantial support and a seeming mandate to uh, uh, to find uh, himself back on his heels after two years in office uh, in a Westminster style parliamentary system that uh, that wouldn't happen. But it's really more than, than a division of uh, uh, a divided party government, different parties holding the presidency and, and, uh, and the Congress. It, it's also a matter of the fact that we have a legislature uh, that's uh, bicameral, lots of veto points, but most importantly, um, there exists in the Senate an effective supermajority requirement for everything of consequence that moves through the body. The framers never intended the Senate to be governed by supermajorities. In fact, they specified the exceptions that would require a two-thirds or three-fourths vote, and every bit of evidence we have is that none of them imagined the Senate would operate any differently than the House when it, when it comes to moving the previous question and, uh, and proceeding to vote on a matter. But over time, 
it's a, it's a fascinating historical story. I don't have to, uh, time to go into it at length, but it all goes back to 1805. Aaron Burr was uh, president of the Senate, um, wanted to clean up the Senate rules, uh, neaten them up, you know, and someone said, why do we have this stupid uh, motion on the previous question? It's an insult to cut off a senator when he's, uh, and they're all he's, were, uh, were speaking. Um, no one thought a thing of it. And so it disappeared. And the basis for normal parliamentary procedure disappeared. It got put into the politics, has a long, fascinating history. But the bottom line is that in the, say, the 70s, about 15% of of major significant legislation was subject to some kind of delay, filibuster related delay or obstruction. Now it's more like 95%, uh, meaning uh, a determined minority party with that can marshal 41 uh, votes um, or an individual senator who prefer, uh, decides to to put a hold on a nomination or a law can, uh, can stop and delay action for extraordinary periods of time. It, uh, it has evolved into, in my view, the least uh, effective, productive legislative body in the democratic world. Uh, so that's the, the first problem we have. Um, We've, we, we have political parties operating in a, that are parliamentary-like, that are highly polarized, that are strategic, that are oppositional, that, uh, that have strong incentives to use the legislative process not to solve problems, but to get back into the majority or to keep from losing the majority. Uh, from holding the White House or losing, uh, 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 gaining back uh, the White House. Um, uh, and it's occurring in a system that just doesn't tolerate it. So that's the first point. All this happy talk, starting with Obama, about leading a post-partisan presidency, uh, continuing now with Mitt Romney saying, ah, oh, yes, I will go and work with the Democrats in Congress, and including Bob Woodward in his 17th book, uh, making an error that would, would cause him to flunk American Government 101. He said, well, President Obama failed last year in, in, in getting a deal to, out of this whole debt ceiling fiasco because he didn't impose his will on Congress. And I said, hello, have you ever had an American government course? Guess what? Presidents aren't empowered with the means to impose their will. Lyndon Johnson imposed his will because he had huge Democratic majorities. It wasn't personal persuasion. Barack Obama could drink a case of bourbon with Republicans in the House and Senate and wouldn't garner him one additional uh, vote, uh, that's for sure. Okay, that's the first problem, mismatch between the nature of our parties and the nature of our governmental system. The second problem is the, is the really awkward one uh, uh, to talk about. Um, uh, Bill and I are at, at the Brookings Institution. We are genuinely nonpartisan. We've got staff members and trustees with different backgrounds, different sort of parties, different sort of public philosophies and ideological views. They're united in a, in a willingness to do rigorous work and have that work judged by their peers in academia and, and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, uh, the last thing we want to be accused is picking sides, of, uh, of saying someone's worse than someone else, that the problem is more on one side or the other. It's the same problem that 
that people operating out of bipartisan groups trying to fashion um, uh, big budget agreements face. It's a problem that reporters working for mainstream news organizations face. They're so subject to criticism for party bias that they bend over backwards not to say anything. Even the fact checkers feel they have to balance their stories so no one, uh, no one is offended or hurt. So there's this reality out there, this, this 800 pound gorilla that has developed in our politics, but it's impolite to say it uh, publicly because once you do, and Norm and I have done it in this book, once you do, people look at you different. Well, you're not really, you know, we can't use you in this setting because, you know, it looks as if you're saying one thing or another. So we've used whatever credibility we've built to over 40 years of Congress watching to point out uh, the obvious, that the emperor wears no clothes. In this case, it's that while in the early decades of polarization, both parties moved toward their polar extreme, uh, in recent times, the Republican Party has lurched very far to the right. Today's, in order to be a Republican today, um, uh, you could not embrace positions that were at the center of Republican proposals a decade or two ago. It just, it just can't happen. The evidence on this is overwhelming from, from votes in, in Congress to analyses of the agenda of the party. And it, uh, it's also heard from many current Republicans, uh, former officials, uh, those who, who sort of keep their nose clean and duck and write private emails about what's going on. But it really, it sort of really is true. It's, it, it's reflected in the, in the kind of Congress Newt Gingrich tried to build, and we were with him at the beginning, uh, 1978. We had him in a series of dinner meetings uh, uh, with other members, Dick Cheney, Jerry Ferraro, a bunch of others, uh, and Newt outlined a strategy to, to really effectively uh, discredit the institution as a way of uh, bringing Republicans into power. Uh, it's a long story. He's, he's a fascinating figure, and he even gave us a blurb for our last book. But the reality is he's changed the culture of our politics and turned it much more tribal. Uh, he's, he's led to a situation where the other side isn't viewed as being legitimate. I mean, that's amazing to say, well, they're not real Americans. They're not legitimate. Um, th the second thing was Grover Norquist and his uh, tax pledge. Uh, uh, you could argue that anyone having the great honor of being elected uh, uh, as president of the United States or as a member of Congress uh, takes the oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution. Uh, signing other pledges, making other oaths, I think is contrary to the job of being a member of Congress. And nothing has more frustrated the ability of policymakers uh, to grapple with our problems than the no new tax pledge. It takes something off the table that, that, that prevents anything from happening. But it's more, it's more than that. It's a, it's a real strategic effort, which is what we saw during the Obama years when, you know, he was either naive or cynical, but he sort of led and went looking for partners in negotiations. He said, oh, if I adopt their ideas, like the, their old health care plan from, from 1993 and four, the Republican alternative, and Mitt Romney's in Massachusetts, then they'll embrace it and we can negotiate. Well, that's not how it works. The point is, in this day and age, if he's for it, we're against it. Uh, and there are a dozen examples I could give you of, uh, of positions changed, of priorities set, of pressure put on individual Republican members to um, uh, 
basically to hold the line uh, and not support anything, uh, even in times of economic crisis. Uh, George W. Bush rose to the occasion near the end of his presidency in the face of a financial collapse that was so catastrophic it could have led to a global depression and took the advice of his Secretary of Treasury and, and, and supported TARP, which the public hates, but uh, because we didn't punish the bankers enough, and that's probably true, but it saved us and the world. Um, and it was mainly paid back, by the way, so it isn't as if uh, something else happened. He also moved on a stimulus. He was, he was trying to do kind of things like Ronald Reagan did by signing taxes after you know, fear of deficits led him to figure he had to do something else. But Bush is disowned. Uh, both Bushes are. They're not real Republicans. Um, and, and we're now in a situation where it's almost as if, uh, you know, the substance doesn't matter because they're new things now and we're again it. You know, we're again it. No new taxes. How could you possibly uh, keep digging a hole uh, if you're really worried about deficits and debt uh, by, uh, by saying we've got to cut taxes uh, more, extend all that we have? Uh, anyways, that's the situation we're in. It's awkward. It's awkward to say, but what we saw in the 112th Congress was breathtaking to us as veteran Congress uh, watchers. Uh, it's not conventional politics. It's not the same thing. And I will end here. Uh, uh, forgive me for going on so long. The great dilemma is this is a function of a mismatch in systems. Uh, uh, parties and institutional means for governing. We could try to make the parties less polarized. We could try to change the institutions to try to allow majorities to rule. That will take a long time. Worth pursuing, lots of ideas out there. But in the short term, we got to figure out to get a little help from the public. And right now, I said I wasn't going to say anything about the election, but right now, the best bet may not happen given recent changes. The best bet is we reproduce as a result of this big election the exact same structure of partisan control that we have now. Obama in the White House, Democrats controlling the Senate, and the Republicans controlling the House. Now, if something hasn't worked very well, and you're really unhappy about it, you'd think this would produce some strategic thinking on the part of voters and some honest assessment of what our problems are. That's what our task uh, is in the remaining weeks of the campaign. Thank you very much. Well, let me begin by echoing uh, Tom's gratitude for this invitation, uh, which is really a marvelous opportunity to share some, some views with you and to have a lot of time available for questions and, and dialogue. Uh, Tom is right. Uh, he and I are indeed colleagues. Uh, and he made a slip that I found oddly flattering, you know, he said that we had been colleagues for seven months. In fact, it's, in fact, it's seven years, but clearly, you know, but clearly, you know, he's enjoyed the experience so much the time just flew by. Uh, now, uh, you know, speaking of, ex speaking of experiences, you know, I had a very startling one just a few hours ago. Uh, as we, as we drove up through Hiram College, uh, I was startled to see a banner, Koratansky Hall. <laughs> and I said to myself, gosh, I thought he was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> but, indeed, 
<laughs> I was, you know, since he had invited me, I was surprised that, you know, it is abrupt demise, but, you know, but he's clearly such a pillar of the institution uh, that he was, you know, he was given the privilege of being able to hear his eulogy prior to his demise. Uh, now, uh, my entire talk is going to be an exegesis of a couple of lines in Tom's talk. Uh, the question I'm going to pose is an historical question. I'm going to move the camera back and for a wider angle gaze. Uh, Tom is absolutely right. Uh, the American political party system is as polarized as it has been for more than a century. Political scientists agree on that. Uh, as for the American people, well, on the one hand, the people are less polarized than the parties. But on the other hand, the people themselves are more polarized than they were a generation ago. So hold those two thoughts in your head simultaneously. And the question is why? How did we get here? And I cannot think of a better way of answering that question briefly than by telling you the story of what has transpired in what I will presume to call my adult political, my adult lifetime. Uh, I entered Cornell University nearly 50 years ago, two months and a bit before the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And let me tell you about the American party system in the fall of 1963. First of all, as Tom has pointed out, uh, each political party was internally diverse. There were liberal Democrats and moderate Democrats and conservative Democrats, but equally there were liberal Republicans, moderate Republicans, and conservative Republicans, and you could locate geographically where the different wings of each political party uh, could be found. And as a result of this internal heterogeneity, the two political parties substantially overlapped ideologically. It was not the case that there was a liberal party and a conservative party in 1963. That was certainly the situation that existed in the 1930s, you know, when Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal did battle with what was left of the Republican Party, and what was left of it was the most conservative piece of it, but there wasn't much left of it. At its low, the Republicans were down to 11 seats in the Senate in the mid-1930s. I mean, so that's fact number one about the old party system. Fact number two is that this wasn't just an ideological matter. There were substantial overlaps of world view between the two political party parties, or to put it slightly differently, shared frames of reference. And let me tell you what I mean by that. First of all, Dwight Eisenhower had led the Republican Party out of the wilderness of opposition to the New Deal. Uh, that was the meaning of his famous 1952 victory over your very own Senator Taft. Uh, and, and over time, not only did the Republican Party make its peace with the New Deal, but it also made its peace with Keynesian economics. Yes, the Republicans cared more about a balanced budget than the Democrats did, but basically we had by the 1960s two Keynesian political parties and as late as 1971, Richard Nixon could announce that we're all Keynesians now. With regard to foreign policy, well, there was a shared perspective, Cold War anti-communism. Go back and take a look at the transcript of the Kennedy-Nixon debate in 1960. Cover up the speakers and you will not be able to figure out who is speaking. Uh, although here's a clue. It turns out that the more hawkish of the two candidates was John Kennedy, who accused the Republican administration of Dwight, Hour, Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon of not being determined enough in, the, in its conduct of the Cold War competition with the, so, the then Soviet Union, 
As you may recall, JFK campaigned on the basis of an alleged missile gap that Dwight Eisenhower had permitted to grow between the United States and the Soviet Union, a missile gap that mysteriously disappeared a few weeks after John Kennedy was sworn in. There was no missile gap. Okay, but the fact that he used that successfully was a sign of how pervasive this unifying foreign policy theme of Cold War anti-communism was. So we have the economic issues, we have the foreign policy issues, and then we have the cultural issues, except there were no cultural issues, right? There was a conspiracy of cultural silence between the two political parties. The civil rights movement was just getting started. Betty Friedan had just written her book, but there was no, there was no women's movement. Did we have a, debor, uh, a, a debate about abortion? No, abortion wasn't even on the national radar screen. Gay rights? No. Uh, there were no publicly debated cultural issues in the early 1960s. That just wasn't what politics was about. Okay, so that's the old party system. How did we get from there to here? Well, very, very briefly. Do you remember stagflation, the combination of economic stagnation and inflation that began to take root in the late 1960s because uh, neither political party was willing to choose between guns and butter? Uh, stagflation destroyed the economic consensus. And by 1978, we had one Keynesian party a demand side party, and one anti-Keynesian party, a supply side party. It was in 1978 that insurgent Republicans led by Jack Kemp uh, took control of economic policy and economic thinking within the Republican Party, and they have never relinquished it, and it was sealed when Ronald Reagan, who was not a supply sider in 1978, decided to embrace that doctrine during his 1980 uh, presidential campaign. What destroyed Cold War anti-communism? Vietnam. I could speak volumes about that, but that's the one word answer to that question. And by the 1972 Democratic Convention, there were two very, very different perspectives on the role of the United States in the world and what should guide us in the pursuit of our foreign policy. And then, on the cultural front, the third great basket, well, uh, let me just read the role. There was the rise of the counterculture, the rise of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the Roe v. Wade decision in the early 1970s, and then the great evangelical mobilization back into American politics after between the Scopes trial in the mid-1920s and, uh, you know, and the early 1970s, evangelicals were virtually absent as a public voice in American politics. And then they came back. And lest we forget, they came back first as supporters of a moderate to conservative Democratic candidate by the name of Jimmy Carter, who carried the evangelical vote. And if he hadn't done it, he wouldn't have carried the state of Ohio. Because they're very important portions of this state, you know, particularly, particularly in the southeast and south central Ohio, that are very much dominated by evangelical Christianity. He carried those regions which Democrats don't usually do. And as a result, he won the state of Ohio by, if memory serves, 11,000 votes out of 4 million cast in 1976. And with it, with it, the election. So the consensus on economics, on foreign policy, and culture destroyed in the 15 years between the time I entered college in 1963 and 1978. Then what happened? Well, first there was a great debate within the Republican Party. 
right? The, the Reagan insurgency of 1976 that came very, very close to denying the nomination of his party to an incumbent president, Gerald Ford. And then again in 1980, where George H.W. Bush memorably called Ronald Reagan's economics voodoo economics. And guess what? At the end of the day, voodoo economics was standing and the Bush, the George H.W. Bush campaign was defeated. And since Reagan's victory in 1980, the Republican Party has been in that frame. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but in that frame. Then there was a great debate that broke out within the Democratic Party. I remember it well because I was part of it. After three consecutive presidential defeats in 1980, 1984, both at the hands of uh, Ronald Reagan. I was Walter Mondale's issues director, so I can give you hour by hour descriptions of what happened in 1984. That was pretty devastating. And then even more devastating was Michael Dukakis's seven point defeat at the hands of George H.W. Bush, who unlike Ronald Reagan, was never accused of being a great communicator, let alone a master politician. But it was at that point that Democrats decided that their problems were more than cosmetic and more than personal. And there was a great debate that broke out within the Democratic Party. But it led, unlike the great debate in the Republican Party, it didn't lead to the Democratic Party going left. It led to the Democratic Party heading back towards the center. That was the meaning of Bill Clinton's nomination. And he then proceeded to pursue an agenda that blended you know, a liberal orientation and a more moderate or centrist orient, or, orientation. Uh, in the latter category, he, you know, his economic policy focused on fiscal restraint and eventually on a balanced budget. Uh, he believed in free trade, which many Democrats, particularly in the Midwest, did not and still do not. Uh, he was in favor of welfare reform, which was anathema to the liberal wings of his party. Uh, he was notoriously tough on crime. And I can tell you that had it not been for some unfortunate personal events, he was prepared to push forward in his second term on a fundamental national reconsideration of the entitlement programs that are now back at the center of public, public debate. And, it and interestingly, Clinton's success in winning election and then re-election uh, pushed the Republican Party or pulled the Republican Party, I would say, back towards the center. Uh, George W. Bush did not run a hard-edged campaign for president in the year 2000 against Al Gore. He ran as a compassionate conservative. He was not running particularly as a limited government conservative. He was running on the proposition that government power should be used to promote conservative causes that would strengthen civil society and therefore strengthen America. And so Bush pursued, Bush won, some people say, on that basis. And, uh, and he then pursued policies such as the No Child Left Behind education reform, which he did in tandem with Senator Ted Kennedy, not a conservative hero. He pushed successfully for the largest expansion of the Medicare program uh, in a generation, the prescription drug program. And you know, he had to break the bones of many of his members of his own party, famously holding a vote on Medicare prescription D, Medicare Part D, open in the House of Representatives for what, something like six hours, Tom, in order to get the 218th vote that, that he needed. It was a period in which domestic spending rose very substantially. And let us not forget that to his undying credit, and I speak as a lifelong Democrat, George W. Bush 
took a big political risk and tried to create a bipartisan immigration reform bill. And wouldn't we be in a better place as a country if that effort had succeeded? Now, at the same time, Bush was an ardent proponent of tax cuts which did not please many Democrats. And of course, there was the, the terrible division in the country over the Iraq war and the techniques uh, for uh, prosecuting the war on terror. So although George W. Bush had a number of more moderate or centrist features in his domestic program, Democrats were deeply angered by the Bush administration and unified during the eight Bush years against George W. Bush. And in my judgment, uh, which Tom, I think, does not entirely share, the Democratic Party unified around a program that was notably, noticeably to the left of the program that Bill Clinton ran on, won on, and, and, govern, and governed on. At the same time, the Republican, the, at the grassroots level, the perceived moderation of the Bush years on domestic, on domestic policy created a ferocious backlash. In my judgment, the seeds of the Tea Party revolt were, le were sown in the Bush years. They flowered during Barack Obama's first two years, but it was as much a desire on the part of grassroots small government conservatives to retake control of the, of, of the Republican Party as it was antipathy to Barack Obama that drove the successful grassroots revolution, which has reoriented the Republican Party in perhaps the most conservative direction, the most conservative stance that anybody in this room has ever seen, barring those who may be old enough to have witnessed uh, Alf Landon's Republican Party. But in spite of the fact there are a number of people in this room who obviously go to the same hair colorist that I do, uh, I don't think there's anybody who goes back quite that far. <laughs> but we shall see. Uh, so, what we have now is a Republican Party that is almost homogeneously conservative and a Democratic Party that is not as homogeneously liberal for a very simple reason. There are twice as many conservatives as liberals in the American electorate. So there cannot be a, a homogeneous liberal party in the United States that is anything like a majority. The Democratic Party is more of an ideological coalition, but moderates and conservatives are less important in the Democratic Party, and liberals are more important than the Democratic Party than they have for decades. This is a, this is a rep recipe not only for polarization, but for gridlock. And that is exactly what we have seen, particularly in the last two years of the Obama administration. But look, the only reason Barack Obama got anything done in his first two years was that for most of that period, he had not just a majority in the Senate, but a supermajority in the Senate of 60 votes, which, every one of which he needed because he couldn't get a single Republican vote. And that generated some interesting episodes like the famous corn husker kickback, if you remember that, to get Nebraska Sen Senator Ben Nelson's uh, vote as the 60th vote for the, Affordable, for the Affordable Care Act. Why does all of this matter? And I'll end exactly where Tom ended. All of this matters because given the current distribution of political preferences in the United States, neither political party can hope to enforce its will on the other party, at least not for very long. If we are going to make progress on the very serious problems that we have, starting with our fiscal situation but hardly ending there, the two political parties 
that have been throwing grenades at each other from their respective foxholes are going to have to relearn the forgotten art of compromise and cooperation. Given where we are now, that is going to be very difficult. And Tom may very well be right that in order to achieve that, one party in the next year or two may have to shift more than the other party. But the, uh, the, fact of the, matter, the fact of the matter is that without a substantial force in the electorate and in the Congress that is prepared to put the task of a search for cooperative solutions at the forefront of its political agenda, the gridlock that we've seen in the past few years is likely to continue. And why does this matter? It matters because the rest of the world is not standing still. We are not hermetically sealed the way we were in the immediate aftermath of World War II, particularly in economic matters. If the rest of the world is moving actively forward and we are stagnating, we are losing ground. And the American middle class and American workers are going to bear the brunt of the price and bear the majority of the consequences for the failure of our political system to come up with a cooperative economic agenda that can begin to address some of the problems that we're now debating in this presidential year. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much and let the discussion continue.